first day in the name of the Father who thought up marriage in the first place in the name of the Son who is at the very centre of true marriage and in the name of the Spirit who marries believers to Jesus. Let me just make a few announcements before we commence worship. We don't have any meeting ourselves as Gateway this evening, but Graham is hoping to be preaching in Fochan at half past six this evening. So if you can, do please uh, go there to worship God together. And then we are planning to start up our Bible study again this coming Thursday at eight o'clock. Uh, I would imagine we may try Zoom just for this, this Thursday, and we'll be talking in session to decide what we're going to do in the, the forthcoming months. And we're going to come back to our studies in Genesis. So if you have your study guide at home, it will be the beginning of study five. And we'll be looking in particular at Genesis chapter 25. And then next Lord's Day, we're going to take a look at Psalm 39 under the title, How Short Life Is. And then the following week, that's this day, two weeks on the 11th of September, we come around the table Jesus set in place. We observe the Lord's Supper together. These are all our announcements. The Apostle Paul writes to believers in Ephesus and everywhere else in a verse that we will read later. Marriage is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. Let's now sing in praise of Christ and the church, part of Psalm 45 together. Psalm 45 on page 93. And we're going to sing from stanza 13 to the end of the psalm to the tune Carlisle number 192. And this psalm, the whole psalm, is really divided into three different parts. The first part speaks of the mighty groom, the bridegroom of the church, and that is a picture of Jesus. And the second part speaks of the beautiful bride who is coming to meet the groom, and that's a picture of the church. And then this last part that we're going to sing from stanza 13 on, it's more to do with the ceremony, the wedding ceremony and the consequences of that. And it recalls God's presenting of Eve to Adam and of the great rejoicing there was at that union. And then the last two stanzas are actually spoken to the king. Jesus himself never married, but how many children he has had by faith. He has restored images of himself right across the world. All are related to the king. All are united to him. This gives us much cause for praise. So Psalm 45 from stanza 13 to the end. Let's praise God.
standing as we come to God in prayer. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for such a glorious psalm that tells us so much about your heart towards us, that shows us that joy is at the center of who you are. And Father, we come to you today through the one you have sent into this world to be our bridegroom, the one who has led down his life so that we may have life, so that we may talk to you today, and so that one day we may be with you in your kingdom forever. Our Father, we thank you for this picture of the bride rejoicing with her friends as she approaches the palace where her wedding is to take place. And Father, you don't have to do these things, but you delight in them. Another psalm talks about the river of your delight and all that is truly beautiful in this world, not just on the surface, but below the surface. It all comes from you. We praise you that you were delighted to make Eve out of Adam's rib. And although it's Adam's praise that we can read in the Bible, you were delighted too at the whole ceremony. You rejoice over your people with singing. However, Father, we need to confess our sins to you today. We don't always seek joy in the places you want us to. We sometimes look for short-term solutions. We're sometimes content with short-term pleasures that often bring us a bitter taste that can move us away from you. Father, you know that we have an enemy who whispers in our ear what we sometimes want to hear. You know that he uses this world that he has corrupted to drive a wedge between us and you. He often makes you out to be mean and unloving whenever this is a lie far from the truth. Forgive us that we listen too often to him, that we toy too much with the forbidden fruit the world offers, that we play with sin rather than turning a hard face to it. Father, we do praise you for Jesus today. We thank you that he is the mighty king of this psalm. He came to defeat enemies on every level. He came to woo us on your behalf. He came to win us back to you by taking the punishment for all kinds of sin that he wasn't guilty of on himself. Our Father, we pray that you would help us to love Jesus with all we have. Help us to love those you have given us better than before. Help us to know the purity of your joy at the center of our lives above everything else. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your Bibles and please turn with me, first of all, to Paul's letter to the Ephesians. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 5, I'm reading at verse 22. And that can be found on page 1228 of the, of the Bibles, the Maroon Bibles. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning to read at verse 22. And this is the passage that we're going to look at later in the service. So just a few things to be looking for as we read these verses. First of all, what is Paul's one command to Christian wives? And the same question about the other section. What is Paul's one command to Christian husbands? But there's something else in these verses as well. What is the bigger picture in these verses? Ephesians chapter 5 at verse 22. This is God's word. Wives, submit to your husbands 
as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now, turning back with me to the very opening pages of the Bible, so it is actually page 59. It's Genesis chapter 2. I just want to read a few verses from the end of Genesis chapter 2. And there's one verse from here that we're going to talk about with Samuel and Thomas and Lydia. So Genesis chapter 2, reading the second part of verse 20 to the end of, of the chapter, or down to verse 24, in fact. Genesis 2, the second part of verse 20. And this again is God's word. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason a man will leave his father and mother, and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. We pray that God will bless to us these readings, and also the preaching of his own perfect truth. I'm just talking to the children for a moment. I have a road sign that I would like you to look at. And let me just show you this one that you've seen a few times. What's that telling us? Caution. caution, indeed. Caution or beware or danger. There's something coming up that you've got to be ready for. Okay. And I have a, a sign I want you to, to look at and see if you can tell me what it is. You know what that sign is saying? The road's getting narrower. It's not getting shorter. Hopefully the road will still take you all the way home. But it's getting narrower. It maybe was wider, and now there's less space for your car, and maybe there's less space for the car coming in the opposite direction. So the road is getting narrower. And that's an important one to be aware of, to be ready for. And I want to show you one that's just a wee bit different. And that's that one. Do you know what that one is? What it is actually is this one is just one road getting narrower. In this one, we actually have two roads, or two parts of a road, with something in between, with a space in between. If you know where the Crescent Link is, where Marks and Spencer's is, then there's, there's a, a division between the two sides of the road there. And that's, that's what we see at that point. And then further on, the road just becomes one. So it's as if two roads become one. And that's actually what I want to talk to you about for just a few minutes today. On Thursday, your mum and dad and Graham and Helen and Anne and James and I 
were at John's and Catherine's wedding. And a wedding is really where two people are becoming one, one unit. Before they were two people, John Neely and Catherine McMeekin. They had different names. But after the wedding ceremony, they've both got the same name. They're both called Neely. So it's two people becoming one, a new unit being formed. Before, although John wasn't living at home, there was a sense in which he was still under our roof and Catherine was under her mum and dad's roof. But now they have left that home and now they're going to live in a home of their own. But the good thing is they won't be far away from us for a while because they're both coming to work and to live in Derry for the first year. So we'll be seeing some of them. So maybe you'll be able to see them in a few weeks and you can ask them how their wedding went, what they thought of their wedding day. It seemed everything seemed to go really well. And they do have interests in common. They are interested in the same things. They're both doctors, so they have their own language. They talk about patients, and they talk about hospitals, and they talk about medicine, and other people listening to them don't understand them. But the two of them understand each other. The two are becoming one. And they even have a little dog. And the little dog is going to come and live with them whenever they're living in their home. And strange as it may seem, John is now doing things that he never did when he was at home. He seems to have learned how to garden. And he seems to have learned how to to do the washing up. And he didn't really show much evidence of that at home. He seems to be moving. It's as if both roads are moving together into one. So they're moving together. And of course, the important thing is that John and Catherine both love each other and trust each other and want to spend the rest of their lives together. But even more important than that, John and Catherine both love Jesus. They have both asked Jesus to be their saviour, to forgive their sin, and to help them to live to please him. And someday, still some way off, I would say, Samuel and Thomas and Lydia, you may think about getting married. And the best thing to prepare you for that is to think about this road sign, and not so much to become one with the person you're going to marry, but to become one with Jesus, to become best friends with Jesus, to share his interests, to tell him things you don't tell anybody else, to ask him to forgive you. Because if you become one with Jesus, then you'll be ready to share your life with someone else, with a young lady or with a young man who has also done that who is also trusting in Jesus. You do remember that that talks about two roads becoming one, that marriage talks about two people becoming one. And the most important becoming one is where one person becomes one with Jesus through trusting in him. So thank you for listening and for answering so well. And just now we're going to sing part of Psalm 51a which is one of the psalms that John and Catherine chose the other day. And we're going to sing different verses from it. It's on page 105, and we're going to sing all that we find on that page, stanzas 5 to 8, to the tune Petra, number 240. And as, as I've just been saying, God is the most important person in anyone's marriage. If you sin seriously against God, then there's going to be real trouble in your marriage. And that's actually what Psalm 51 is about. But it's all to do with David coming to God and asking God to forgive him and to cleanse him and to restore his relationship. If you look at stanza 8, You no sacrifice desire, else an offering make would I. Offerings burnt give no delight, but a broken heart, contrite, 
is to God a sacrifice that, O oh God, you'll not despise. God wants our hearts that are broken because of our sin. We are humble because we're aware of our sin that we can't remove. But we're trusting in God to provide a sacrifice and to restore us to our relationship with him. So Psalm 51a, from stanza 5 to stanza 8, let us again praise God. marriage. It's not something that was thought up by human beings. And so it only works according to your rules. One man and one woman for life. And Father, we thank you that we can see something of your work in this regard, in this fellowship. In many families, you have brought two different people, two sinful people together and created a new covenant unit with yourself at the center. Father, we want to pray for all of the marriages of all our members. You brought couples together. Sometimes over many years, you have kept us together. You have sent children according to your will. Our Father, we pray that you would help us to be true to you first, and to be true to each other. Help us to see the temptations of this world. Help us to take steps to resist these temptations. Help us to know Jesus' love at a deep level in our own lives so that we can show something of Jesus' love for the church, for us, in and through our marriages. Father, we pray for those in our fellowship who are not still married. We pray that you would be especially close to such. Help them to know you as their husband, as the one who has their best interests at heart, and help them even to know you in a deeper way than we who are still married. 
Father, we pray too for those who are not yet married. Help them above all to be working on that relationship with you as that is the best preparation they can make for marriage. Help them also to be aware of the different compromises, the different shortcuts that the world may want them to take. Help them to resist these things and to keep themselves pure as Jesus has purified us. And Father, we turn now to the passage that we read earlier. We pray that you would help us with these words that we probably know very well. We pray that you would remind us of things that we may know already. We pray too that you would even teach us something new today and help us to renew our love for you and our vows to each other as the result of our time spent worshipping you and hearing from your word. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please have your Bibles open at Ephesians chapter 5 as we spend some time in this passage together. Page 1, 2, 2, 8. Did you see this story in the papers this past week? Did you see this picture? It's not a trick picture. It's not some kind of double exposure. It looks as if you got the same couple twice. These are actually two identical twin men who have married two identical twin women. And each couple has had a little boy. And they're all wearing clothes to kind of pick them out as the, the identical girls, the identical fellows, and the two children. So far, so good. When you hear that the two women actually set out to marry a pair of twins, it does begin to sound a little worrying. Apparently, they originally met at the Twins Day Festival which takes place where? In Twinsburg, Ohio, every year. What creates further concern is that the two couples and their children all live in the one house. The older of the two little boys has some words, and he's been heard speaking of his two dadas. I hope it doesn't sound racist or nationist if there's such a word, but we might say only in America. This past week has seen the wedding of John to Catherine, and those who were there heard David Mackay speak of God's ordering of marriage. This country is gradually moving further and further away from God's blueprint, but he hasn't issued any fresh instructions. What we have in both of those passages we read earlier, those passages give us God's mind on the matter. In language that in our present situation may be difficult to accept, but really it's not that difficult to understand. And according to these passages, this is how God wants believers to live. This is how God wants family relationships to operate. He is the one who designed marriage. As the Book of Common Order says, marriage was ordained for the welfare of human society, which can be strong and happy only where the marriage bond is held in honour. So it's really the welfare of society that's also at risk when people turn their back on what God is saying. Well, let's examine today what God is saying to us through Paul in light of the changing culture around us. 
The sermon title is just simply Families Under God. Families Under God. And this hopefully is relevant for all of you today. For those of you who are presently married. It's good regularly to return to these verses. To check ourselves out. It's also helpful for those of you who have been married, but are not now by reason of death, by reason of divorce. And if you're considering marriage, or if someone is considering you for marriage, whether you know it or not, then these are words you need to pay attention to as well. Let's just work our way, at least a little part of the way down the passage, to hear what God is saying to wives and husbands, before we take a closing look at the overall picture God is painting here, the deeper lesson that he's teaching. But first of all, let's listen to the words to wives. Words to wives. Verse 22. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Note that Paul is addressing himself to women first. Women occupied an inferior position in the Roman, in the Greek society of Paul's day. But Paul's comments to women, to wives particularly, are not some kind of footnote that you can just pass over. He considers what he has to say from God to wives as so important that he puts it first. And he's really saying just one thing to wives. And later, just one thing more fully to husbands. And that's why this passage is so helpful. This is not a scattergun approach, throwing out all kinds of different commands, difficult commands. The one command for wives in this passage is what? What is the one command? That's right, Alma. The word submit. Submit to your husbands. Now it says husbands. That doesn't mean you have more than one. The wives are plural and the husbands are plural. It means each wife submit to your husband as to the Lord. It doesn't say that all men have authority over you so that you have to submit to every man. That would certainly favor one sex over the other which God doesn't do. But even the very nature of the wedding ceremony illustrates what Paul means. On Thursday past, Catherine came into the church fashionably but not distressingly late on her father's arm. And after the service, she left on John's arm so something significant had taken place. And David Mackay actually underlined this. Up until that day, she was under the authority and the protection of her father. But on Thursday, as she married John, she moved from her father's protection under John's protection and authority. A new covenant unit has been formed with John as the head of that home. That's quite a daunting thing for a young man to take on. In order for that to work properly, both John and Catherine have formally left the authority of their respective families. So I am no longer covenantally responsible for John's actions. And I would have to say there's a sense of relief about that. But there's also a sense of happiness that as God intends, something new and hopefully strong and true is beginning to grow and develop. And God's command to Catherine is to submit to John. Those of you who were there may have noticed exactly what Catherine and John were promising to do. John promised in the vow David Mackay put to him, because the words were slightly different. He promised to keep Catherine and to support her. For her part, 
Catherine promised to obey John. Not a very fashionable word. I hope that that distinction doesn't have to be pointed out very often. But it is there. And it's based on what God, through Paul, is saying to wives here. I want to try to help you grasp what this word submit means. If you look at the NIV, or indeed at the ESV, if that's the Bible you're using, you'll see that the word submit is used four times, from verse 21 to verse 24. In the original, the word submit is only there twice, although the idea of submitting fills the entire paragraph. And the word submit isn't actually in verse 22. It's actually carried over from verse 21. So we need to look a little at verse 21. And it is quite tricky. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And the question is, which section does it properly belong to? The earlier section or this section on marriage? You might think with the verb to submit, it should be put with verses 22 to 24. But it is related to the verses going before it. If you just want to take a look at the passage, just to see how this works. If you look at the end of verse 18, Paul gives a positive command. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And then there's a series of lesser commands that depend on that filling with the Spirit to do with the praise of God, to do indeed with all of life. And then verse 21, when we come to it, it seems to be another overall command. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, to tie up the section, and to introduce the next one. And just notice what verse 21 is saying. It's talking about mutual submission in the church. Now that doesn't mean that there are no positions of authority in the church, that we all just do what we want. Nor does it mean that Christians can never get anything done because we're so busy submitting to each other and letting the other person go first. But it is in that spirit of mutual submission that Paul's command in verse 22 is given, especially in light of the even harder command that Paul is going to give to husbands. Verse 22 certainly doesn't give husbands the right to demand their wife's obedience to their every whim. I heard John MacArthur define submission this way. It's one person putting the wishes and the welfare of another person before his or her own. One person putting the wishes and the welfare of another person before his or her own. Husbands, Christian husbands, are already putting the will of Jesus and the word of Jesus before their own. The more a wife sees that that is true in her husband, the easier she will find it to submit to him. I don't know how many of you have seen a wrestling match. Wrestling used to be on every Saturday afternoon. I think it was ITV when I was growing up. My gran, for some strange reason, my father's mother, took a great delight in watching wrestling. I'm not sure that she realized that most of the bouts were actually fixed. But one of the, the main aims of wrestling was to pin your opponent to the canvas of the ring and to demand that he submit. And there's one sense in which what we're talking about now is like that. But there's another sense in which it's not. The person who's submitting is giving in. He's saying, that's my part in the contest over. I'm done. I'm giving in. It's up to you now. And that is what a wife is saying to her husband. I'm not fighting with you over this. I'm surrendering my will to you because I have already surrendered myself to Jesus. 
I realize this is the cost of my love. And that's really what Paul is saying in verse 24. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. The wife takes the position of the church while the husband takes the position of Christ. But marriage is not like a wrestling match because it's not forced submission. Paul is not telling husbands to make their wives give in to them, to force them down onto the canvas so that they can't move. I think if you want to see how liberating a, a real true marriage can be, there's nothing better than Proverbs 31. This is a woman who is submitting to her husband, but look how free she is, look how productive she is, and look at the praise that her husband heaps on her. This is a direct command to wives. Paul is telling wives to submit. It's a willing submission. Husbands are not to lord it over our wives. Where a major decision is required, we are to be big enough to take responsibility for that decision. But certainly we are to consult our wives, not to decide things over her head. But we have to carry the can. Someone has to take responsibility. And before God, we will. Especially in the disciplining of children. It can get quite rocky. Where we don't always know what's right. But we have to let our wives and our families know that God has set us as the head. As verse 23 says. And to take the flack that comes from that. These days there are Christian feminists who argue that the head, that just means the source, just as Adam was the source of Eve. But that's not all that Adam is. It does also talk, the word head also means one who exercises authority, just as the head determines what the body does. And that's the image that's used in this passage. Our wives may often be in the position of the neck that turns the head. Just one thing before we move on. Verse 22 tells wives to submit to your husband as to the Lord. Submit to your husband as you have already been submitting to God. In other words, there should be a living relationship, a loving relationship, a saving relationship between you and Jesus before there's a marriage relationship with another human being. And this also means that your husband is not the ultimate authority. God is. And that means additionally that a husband's directions and decisions are to agree with what God says in his word. If a Christian husband asks a Christian wife to do something forbidden in God's word, the woman must respectfully refuse and seek to change her husband's mind. I do believe that Paul chooses these two commands because each of them is the hardest thing for each person to do. It's harder for a wife to submit to her husband than to disregard him and do her own thing. It's much easier for a wife to belittle her husband. Women are often better with words than we men are. But that kind of situation is much worse for the marriage because it develops into a battlefield of disrespect and nagging. And Paul's final words in the chapter are to encourage wives to respect their husbands. As we come now to consider Paul's words to husbands. The same thing is operating with us too. What's Paul telling husbands to do? Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's the one command. It's easier for us to seek to browbeat our wives 
to get our own way or to ignore our wives if they want something we don't want. It's much more costly. It's much more demanding to love our wife. But that's what God wants. If you ladies think that submitting to your husband is a tall order, and it can be in today's society, just think about what husbands are being asked to do. To love your wife as Christ loved the church. To give up your life for your wife. In other words, to consider her life of more importance than yours. Further down the passage, Paul is rightly and wisely speaking about how believers look after our bodies. These days there are whole industries devoted to exercising the body, feeding the body, overfeeding the body, grooming and beautifying the body. Man, how much time and effort and even money have you spent this past week in any or all of these departments? It's not wrong to look after your body. It's the only one you'll have in this world. Verse 28 says explicitly, in this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. But as Paul says in verse 31, as he quotes from Genesis, believers are no longer to consider ourselves as single people, but rather as part of a larger unit. Two people have become one flesh on so many different levels. So we are to seek to love our wives with the same energy and expense we give to looking after our own bodies. When you think about loving your wife as Christ loved the church, think of the places Jesus, our head, went to. Think of the things he suffered in order to cleanse and purify his body, the church. How can we ever approach a hundredth, a millionth of what he did? He who never allowed a selfish thought or a proud thought, room to germinate in his mind, never mind in his life. At the wedding service the other day, John and Catherine chose to sing part of Psalm 51. That was a very wise and revealing choice. For Psalm 51, as we were seeing in those other verses we sang, deals with sin and cleansing. And nothing brings sin more to the surface and makes our need for cleansing and for God's grace more pressing than marriage. Have you heard this saying? Love is a word, but marriage is a sentence. It's quite clever. It's a pun on the word sentence. Sentence is a number of words arranged together, or a sentence is a number of days or months or years spent in prison. Let me just read you some words which amplify this. When we get married, love itself comes to live with us. Marriage is a trap. It is a trap of pure love. The love is so pure, so intense, that it can be like a big iron gate that clangs shut behind us. And the one and only key has been handed over to our partner, a total stranger, to swallow. That comes from a lovely, lyrical, thoughtful book entitled The Mystery of Marriage. It's been out from about 1985, so it's not recent. Canadian has written it. He maybe even named it as an echo of that verse where Paul talks about this is a great mystery. The mystery of marriage, which I would recommend. Two things at least can prevent us from loving our wives, as Paul encourages us to do here. One of those two things 
is laziness. I have a second book I want to, to commend to you or recommend to you. It's called, What Did You Expect? Redeeming the Realities of Marriage. It's quite a, a thick book, but there are hardly any footnotes, which I think means that everything that's written here is the author's own experience. He is explaining many Bible passages, and he's also using quite a few examples to, to get across his points. It's quite a searching book, very helpful book. I am aware that Paul Tripp in recent years has been criticized for some of the things he has said. This was written 12 years ago. I haven't found anything so far that I would take issue with. A very helpful book. I'm going to, to read a little bit of what he says on laziness. He says, we know that we shouldn't go to bed angry. Picking up there, Ephesians chapter 4. But it seems that it will take too long to solve our conflict. You walk away from an argument, and you know that you should go back and ask for forgiveness. But you don't know what you will get into if you do. Laziness is rooted in self-love. Laziness expects more from others than we require from ourselves. I am persuaded, he says, that laziness is a much bigger deal in our marriages than we have tended to think. So laziness prevents us from loving our wives. And the other one is, and there are certainly many others, but these are two core ones. Selfishness does too. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, the real cause of failure ultimately in marriage is self. We like to think that when we're loving our wives, we'll get something back for our effort. But when we don't get as much back as we'd hoped, we draw back. We don't try just as hard. Sad to say, most of us are more plugged into a religion of works. If I do so and so for her, then she should do such and such for me. We're more plugged into that than into a religion of grace, which is simply looking for opportunities to benefit the loved one. Does Jesus' love for his people depend on how lovable we are? Or is it in fact his love, his lack of laziness, his lack of selfishness, his self-sacrifice that makes the vital change, that brings a loving response from us, which only God himself can give? Let me come in particular to verse 29. To show you husbands, you would-be husbands, two things to be doing. Don't be lazy, don't be selfish, that's negative. These are the positive things. As you would seek to love your wife or your future wife. Verse 29, after all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for him, just as Christ does the church. I need to heed this verse. In fact, this whole passage as well. Those words, as the NIV presents them, sound a little mundane. To feed and to care for. The authorized version uses the words to nourish and to cherish. And those words sound a little grander and fuller. But what Paul is wanting us to do works on different levels. These things should have an ordinary, everyday clothes, as well as a fancy outfit that you might wear to a wedding. We husbands are to nourish our wives, to feed them on the good things we receive from God, winter and summer. It's good to spend time in God's Word. It's good to spend time in prayer to God on our own. But it's also good to share what God has been showing us with the person we love most in the world. James is responsible for Bible reading notes. Speak to him if you want some. There are other kinds of helps. To feed yourself on God's word. To nourish your wife too. Let me just show you two. 
These are both by Dale Ralph Davis. They're both Old Testament, but there are many New Testament helps as well. This is on the chapters that we've been studying recently. Genesis 25, it actually finishes with. But anything by Dale Ralph Davis is worth reading and studying, not just yourself, but together. And in these kinds of books, there are also questions to help. The word cherish speaks of the high value you place on your wife. Like the author of Proverbs 31, who praises his wife as worth far more than rubies. The NIV says, care for, care for your body, care for your wife, practically ministering to your wife's needs. Married men here today, there were qualities that attracted you to your wife in the early days of your relationship. Have those qualities matured and ripened and developed under your care and protection? Or is there need for some more particular spiritual tending and even pruning for fruit to come? Don't forget Jesus had to be planted in the ground like a seed so that his church might grow. And that brings us briefly to the last point. We've heard God's words to wives and God's words to husbands. Let's finish with God's words about Jesus. God's words about Jesus. If Paul was intending to bring Jesus in at the very end of the passage, say in verses 31 to 33, if he was intending that, he's done a very bad job. Because if you read through the passage from verse 22 on, you'll hardly find a verse that doesn't include Jesus. So this has never been about a husband and wife on a horizontal plane. This has always been from the very start about something much bigger. Something that involves Jesus submitting himself to the Father as he asks us to submit ourselves to him. It's not even just about a personal relationship with Jesus, although that is essential. If you look at verses 25 to 27, you must see that you are unholy by nature, full of stains and blemishes, which can only be removed by cleansing in the blood of Jesus through his resurrection, as God's word, God's word teaches everywhere. It's not even just about Jesus being the third unbreakable strand in a marriage. Apparently a triangle is the, the strongest shape known to man. If you've got the two people on the, the one level and both related to Jesus, that's a strong shape that is very difficult to destroy. That's why it has to be one man and one woman related to Jesus through marriage, not any other combination. But this is about how every believer is personally united to Jesus so that we collectively form his bride. Every believer has a spiritual union with Jesus into his body, the church. So if you think about that, that road sign with the two roads becoming one, the two becoming one, we become one with Christ. Every believer becomes one with Christ. And that's why the church in this world will never die, because it's filled with the life and the love of Jesus. So to those of you today no longer married, you have the privilege of knowing Jesus more closely than many who are still married. Enjoy that privilege and work at it. Husbands and wives still married, you have the privilege of showing something of Jesus and his bride to a world obsessed with eros, obsessed with self, 
do so humbly, but joyfully. Potential husbands and wives, you need to be working on your bond with Jesus so that you'll be ready for your partner when the day comes. And all believers must be looking forward to that day when we shall see Jesus, the one who loves us so much, when we shall be part of his bride in the one true love story that never ends. Let's stand as we talk to God together. Our Father, we do thank you for this passage. We realize these are simple commands, but they're heavy too. They're full of implications. They're totally against our culture. But we do thank you that you know better than we do. Help us to see the wonder of these things, to see the direction, to see the trajectory in which they're heading, to anticipate the glory that they point to, that of your redeemed church, so that we can work in the particular circumstances you have called us to, so that we may show something eternal, something real, something of your heart to a world that is just thirsting for true love and forgiveness. Father, we pray for those who do not yet love you. We pray that you would show them their stains, show them their blemishes, which only Jesus can remove. We pray that you would create in them a hatred for sin and a love for Jesus and faith in Jesus that nothing can destroy. We do pray that you would help us this week to seek to live for him who has lived and died and risen again for us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We close our service by singing together Psalm 128. On page 324, we sing this to the tune Beecher 254. This is a picture of a productive and fruitful family expressed in covenant language from the very first word, blessed are all who fear the Lord. There's something internal, fear of God, reverence, understanding of who God is, acceptance of his power and his holiness. But there's something external too, walking in his ways, ordering a family life around him. And there are promises then, not just for this generation, but for the next and even the one beyond that. Faith resting in the Saviour, the God of the church. Psalm 128. Let's praise God together.
the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.